computer. Oh, she is so loud. She is so loud. Okay, so getting started in Art 116 with this idea of a tetrad, tetrad um, composition. So the tetrad color scheme, P tetra, which you guys no doubt know, tetrad, is going to be our color scheme. And that is really based off of a square superimposed on a color wheel. And so we're going to want to take a square and actually cut it out or fold it up, superimpose it on the color wheel, and turn it around to find four colors that we want to work with. And the four colors are going to be, you know, really kind of nicely spaced out on the color wheel so that we usually get two that are warm colors, two that are cool colors, two that are relatively high key colors, and two that are relatively low key colors. So we got a color range um, based on the color wheel that we could work with to do a composition. When you choose your four colors, you have to write them down. You can only use those four colors. You can't vary from those four colors because it has to be a tetrad for this. The um, one other way of making a tetrad is to take a complementary color pair and do a split complement off of each side. So you get these four colors to work with. So, and it can be any complementary color pair on the color wheel, but you have to do this double split complement in order to get the four colors that would be the colors that you're working with for this color scheme. So using the color wheel to choose your colors for the tetrad is the first part of this job. So moving then to um, kind of looking at Cezanne's um, app. Um, uh, I think that in the um, assignment that I've got, um, there are attachments to the assignment, including one um, uh, Microsoft Word document that has this attached to it. So if you open up that assignment page in um, coursework for the assignment for this thing, there should be this image on the Microsoft Word document and you can print it out or you can look this up online, you know, it, just look up Cezanne, Paul Cezanne's uh, Still Life with Apples and you'll get to this thing. If you want to see where he is putting his colors and how he is working with these apples um, in his original painting, it's kind of nice to have an original to look at as a visual reference so that you can interpret this. You don't have to copy it exactly, but it's nice to have something to go by when you're trying to interpret. So I'm gonna move this aside. I actually have, um, you know, I could start doing this. What, I, what we wanna do is uh, interpret this with dots. We're gonna paint, paint in a style of painting called pointillism that comes from, um, George Seurat, who was a contemporary of Cezanne, one of the post-impressionists from France, and he painted with dots. So we're actually going to paint with the wrong side of the paintbrush to create those dots. Now, to get us a little bit further into this demonstration and me just starting off with some paint and a blank thing and some dots, I can do that. Let's do that. I'm going to do that. I'm going to take some of this violet paint here and just start painting dots in here to kind of play a little bit. And actually, I think I'm going to want, since this is my darker color, this is a low value color, I'm going to be looking for these crescent shaped um, shadows that are on the, on the shaded side of each um, object and kind of put my dots in there. So this is gonna take a while. This painting will probably take somewhere between six and eight hours to do. And this is really the kind of thing that you can plug into some music and just kind of do this kind of painting almost mindlessly so that you're letting you know, the, the paintbrush do all of the work in the painting. But I need, to, I need to take this to the next level with this demonstration, because if I do this for an hour, you guys are gonna go completely nuts. So I'm gonna move from this beginning of the demonstration to someplace in the middle of the process. Here's a student piece that got turned in a couple years ago. It's been abandoned. I think it really needs some help. 
the, the color tetrad was violet, green, red, and orange. I got no problem with this tetrad, but we've got some relatively um, flat colors that have happened. All of these colors were created by using um, this dot making process with the wrong end of the paintbrush, but um, we've got relatively uniform and like monochromatic or one color shapes in a lot of these shapes. And so I'd like to break these up a little bit. So let's just assume that I'm two or three hours into the painting process and I've got this thing going and I've still got some violet and some orange paint on my palette. So I'm gonna come in here and use the violet paint to kind of come in here and break up, you know, especially the, the um, crescent shaped um, uh, shadow on the shaded side of the piece of fruit. Um, when we're thinking about this composition, we've got um, the light source is coming in from this direction here. We've got a pool of light in the foreground that we're dealing with. This portion just off center to the left of each piece of fruit has the highlighted portion of the light shining on it. And so that tends to advance towards the viewer's eye. And the part that makes that also participates in making these three dimensional objects is the crescent shaped shadow on the right edge of each one of the apples. Each apple is a little bit different. Each apple has unique coloring, uh, mostly because they're not modern apples. They're more like uh, heirloom apples. And so we're gonna have to go in there and kind of play with some of these brush strokes and some of these color choices that the, the original artist had and reinterpret these things so that we've got these um, crescent shaped um, shadows over on the sides to kind of break that up. So coming back in here, that's what I'm playing with is bringing some violet in here and kind of bringing that into this crescent shape um, in this portion of the fruit. And so I'm gonna do a little bit of that. I call this interspersing color. Um, We've established, uh, you know, some very um, uh, kind of strong color shapes in the composition. We've got our pool of um, yellow light in the foreground, yellow orange light. We've got our yellow orange um, areas on most of the pieces of fruit here um, where they're being uh, illuminated. We've sort of got something happening on each piece of fruit that is a crescent shaped shadow. We've got cool and um, lower value colors in the background where there are shadows and shadows between the pieces of fruit. But now we have to kind of, you know, use our colors and intersperse them a little bit to break up color shapes so that they're not just Johnny one note um, colors, but that they have a lot of depth and a lot of movement. And we're kind of using the other colors in our four color um, tetrad as effectively as possible to kind of you know, interpret these shadows and see how this can actually work as a more blended uh, painting. We're interested with this approach to pointillism in optical color mixing instead of trying to mix the colors by painting them wet in wet with wet paint and doing a lot of color blending with our paintbrush. That's why I'm kind of using a paintbrush, uh, we're using the wrong end to uh, put down these pure dots of paint in a kind of a strange interpretation of uh, the colors that I've got to work with here. So I'm going to put this aside for just a second and pull another piece out of here that has, that's a lot, further along in this process so we can talk about this. So as you can see, we've got, I guess, a yellow, orange, a violet. Let's see, this person has a yellow, or a red, orange, and I think there's a blue in here, or a blue, violet. So those would be the four colors in this one. And once again, let's come over here and see what's happening in the crescent-shaped shadow, because we've got some of the yellow, orange, in the crescent shaped shadow. We've also got some of the violet and some of the blue violet um, and even some of the red orange 
is interspersed in here and overlapping. And so that makes a really interesting effect that is very soft and subtle. And your eye has to do kind of optical color mixing. Your brain, your, your visual perception system has to kind of mix those colors together so that from a distance that actually looks like a blended shadow that has some neutrality in it that helps make the whole fruit kind of pop forward three dimensionally. We do the same thing in the background. We've got um, kind of equal parts of all the different colors are interspersed with each other in the shadows in the background. That tends to neutralize the background. I don't have any bright colors and I don't have any you know, strong um, colors because all four of the colors are kind of interspersing with each other. They tend to all neutralize each other and give me a neutralized background that tends to recede in space. So that actually pushes the background back away from our eyes while this huge puddle pool of yellow light, yellow orange light, which is predominantly yellow orange. I would say that 95% of all the dots down here are yellow orange. That tends to advance towards the viewer's eye because it's such a strong, bright, um, high value, um, warm color that tends to come towards the viewer's eye because this is so neutralized with all the colors combined with each other and interspersed with each other that tends to knock the background back. So the whole effect of this, if I can actually pick this up, is to make the front part portion of the painting um, advance towards the viewer. And so I'm tipping it towards the viewer and it makes the, the rear portion of the tabletop tend to recede. So you can actually tip this thing like this and the rear kind of recedes in space and the, for, the front kind of advances in space as a three-dimensional kind of an object. That is how it's working on a two-dimensional surface using the paint in this way. So when I go back to my painting that I was working on, which needs a lot of help, um, I'm gonna want to find the paint so that you can see it. I'm going to want to intersperse dots. There's no problem with having a couple of violet dots, even in the middle of an orange area of the fruit. Maybe they could be a little bit more towards the outside, Maybe they can be just kind of interspersed a little bit in a random kind of a way. And we're just gonna kind of dot those dots like that, just to break up the color shape so that the color shape isn't so uniform and um, flat. And we just play this game of overlapping colors and interspersing color dots to try to get an effect that becomes three-dimensional. You have to do this as an act of faith. You kind of have to take my word for it because this is something that you, we just don't want to do naturally. Um, you, we usually want to just you know, paint solid color shapes where we've got the um, high key bright ones, warm ones, in the foreground or in the front of the shape, in the highlighted area of the shape. And we put, want to put the dark, um, low key, um, cooler values in the shadow. But light doesn't work just like that. It's much more um, interesting and um, kind of uh, subtle. So I'm going to stop doing violet for just a second and I'm going to get into my yellow our orange puddle and do the same kind of thing. And I might even take the occasional orange dot and put it back here into the shadow just to make sure that you guys know that you can intersperse dots in a way that is counterintuitive, but that helps to break it up. It helps to break up that um, area of the composition that we would assume would be really dark and low value and it starts to break up the color and make it a little bit more interesting to look at. I'm going to take some orange and even put a little bit of orange into these, um, uh, these shadow areas where the stem 
comes out of the apple. In every apple, there's the plate, there's this depression on the one end of the apple where the stem comes out of it. That's where the blossom originated, where the blossom started. And even though that's a shadow, and you know, it's so it's a dark, low value, um, cool area on the composition, it still is going to have some piece of something that wants to kind of stick out of it and um, uh, be highlighted um, just to break up that shape so that the shape isn't so monolithic. And now I'm actually back here in some of the shadows, breaking up some of the shadows with just a smattering and interspersing of dots back in the shadows a little bit. Um, on a something that's a completely separate note, I wanted to talk to you guys about the Super Bowl this weekend, because generally in um, a design class, we like to take a look at the Super Bowl ads that have been specifically designed for like one time use in the Super Bowl by all of these companies that pay millions of dollars for both the construction of the ad and also um, having it aired on the Super Bowl. So advertising is kind of a part of design. It's an interesting part of kind of the visual arts. Uh, I don't get to talk about it very much. The Super Bowl offers us an opportunity to kind of talk about the craziness of creativity in advertising, especially when it all comes together as something as uh, big a deal, I guess, uh, from a cultural standpoint as the Super Bowl. We don't have very many cultural artifacts anymore where we all get together and watch the same thing at the same time and have a shared experience. The Super Bowl becomes one of those opportunities. Would love to invite you guys to um, watch the Super Bowl or at least watch the Super Bowl cartoons because there are becoming lists of them uh, for the 2020 Super Bowl cartoons on YouTube. And so that you have some familiarity with them. On Monday, after the Super Bowl, I'd like to um, play a list of the top 10 or whatever Super Bowl cartoons, just so that we can uh, review them and critique them, just as if you know it was a regular critiquing process, and we can talk about what's going on in the cart in the commercial. Um, is it? Are they using humor? What kind of um, new or trendy or whatever kind of thing are they doing to um, capture the imagination of the viewer and get you to be interested in or buy the product that they're trying to sell? There's a big, um, there's big controversy this week about Coca-Cola raising its prices because everything else in the country seems to be raising their prices. And should Coca-Cola raise their prices just because everybody else is? Coca-Cola makes a ton of profit on soda because all it is is sugar carbonated water. And yet, um, you know, the company is considering raising prices just to follow suit with what's going on with everybody else in the country um, here in the middle of inflation and, you know, the tail end of the epidemic. And everybody thinks that, um, there's such demand everywhere for stuff that it's a good idea to start just raising prices because we can make a little bit of extra profit. And um, people who are employees are trying to um, get more money um, uh, in wages uh, from quitting and looking for other jobs and stuff. So there's lots of interesting economic pressures out there. Um, that are pushing up prices and wages, and that usually causes inflation. I was a high school kid um, in the late 1970s and early 1980s when we had a really bad rash of inflation in the country, and now it's been about um, 40 years since then. And you know, so um, inflation has been kind of really absent from our economy for a long, long time. But a lot of that has to do with um, uh, we, we, we sent a lot of jobs and a lot of manufacturing overseas. So instead of making everything you know, in the United States for the most part, in the Rust Belt, in the Midwest, uh, we offshored a lot of jobs and a lot of industries to uh, the Pacific Rim, to China, 
and a lot of uh, other countries on the Pacific Rim. And while that worked out really good for a really long time, um, you know, the, uh, the shipping uh, backlog and stuff that's part of the pandemic has shown us that we are vulnerable then to um, supply chain issues and stuff. And so then we can't get stuff and pieces and parts on time. And so the automotive industry it has been severely impacted by that other industries. And that is also a, a driver for this new round of inflation that we're having. Uh, all of that getting us back to um, the Super Bowl because they're really interested in selling you a bunch of stuff. And we wanna look at that stuff and see, you know, A, is it worth having? Is it worth having because of the advertising and the interesting ways that advertisers have in um, you know, convincing you that this is stuff that you just got to have? And uh, so I think that you know, looking at the Super Bowl commercials is a great way of kind of considering the most uh, expensive and also the most creative advertising that advertisers do. And then we can talk about it and then dispense with it. Um, which is a nice way to do things in a college class. So we're gonna look at Super Bowl ads on Monday. Um, we're gonna keep working on this project throughout the next uh, week, a week and a half or so. But Monday, we're gonna take a tiny little break to consider Super Bowl ads. Um, I've been talking for a while and demonstrating for a while and trying to talk about the interspersing of dots and not just um, making really solid areas of dots. You may have to make really big solid area shapes of dots for the first um, you know, hour or two to try to cover your um, composition with color. But eventually we've got to break up all of those colors with this interspersing technique of dots too. So that's also going to be a thing that we have to do in the fullness of time. This pretty much concludes my talking part of the demonstration today. I've been talking for about 25 minutes or so. Um, so uh, this has been transformed a little bit by interspersing the dots. I've been able to break up some of the shapes just a little bit and get them to, to play more of a kind of an interactive role uh, with working with the colors within instead of just being uh, shape, color shapes that are dominated by one particular color. And as we break up and intersperse with, uh, with the other colors of the four color tetrad, we get that optical color mixing that we're looking for. Um, is there any questions either online or uh, in the classroom? about this kind of stuff. Um, if you're online and have a question or a comment that you'd like to make, you just go right ahead and unmute that microphone and ask that question. Anybody in the classroom um, experiencing this process for the first time now? You're, you can see in the classroom, we've got seven people in here who are crazy. Um, all sending out Morse code messages on their um, Taptronic uh, paintbrushes. And so it really sounds like a bunch of uh, woodpeckers uh, working away in the classroom. It's a lot of fun that way. Questions from online? I don't see you guys uh, un unmuting your mics very much. Nobody in here has a question because you know, they're just working so hard. So, oh, yes, Taryn, what's up? You're unmuted, but I don't hear anything. Oh, there's something in the chat, maybe. Let me go look and see if there's something in the chat for me to look at. There's one message in the chat. It's me. I was letting you know I was here. I was having issues with my computer. I am homesick. All right. Thanks, Christine. Nah. Um, <laughs> And I, I, um, I recorded this today. I'm going to try to actually get this recording up because there weren't too many mistakes and not too much dead time in this uh, demo. So I'm going to put this one up on YouTube so that you can go look at it in case your computer was being problematic. And so I think that's going to wrap this up for today. 
I want to thank you guys online for joining us. And this is the project. Um, I'm going to slide my little self in front of this camera for a second. Coming around to this table. Hello, this is me over here. I'm going to hold up the blank and say that you guys who have not received one of these yet, you can come over to... Um, to Eden Hall, to Eden Hall room seven and actually pick one of these up. There is a big pile of them right there on the, on the corner of that table. There's 40 of them or so that are still on the corner of the table. And so you can pick up one or two of these if you want to have um, a really good cardstock copy of this to work with and to, um, to work on at home. Otherwise, I think we're going to leave it today. I'd like you guys to look at the Super Bowl commercials over the weekend. We're going to critique Super Bowl commercials on Monday, taking just a slight break from this project. But if you can get a start on this project, that'd be really good. Select your Tetrad and dive into the project because this is just going to take a long time to do. Having said all that, and that was a lot to say, I have to close the participants list. Oh, here we go. I can end.